Thank you. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, as Merrily said, um, I'm going to provide for questions uh, points. In the first half of my presentation today, I'm going to talk about the Hathi Trust Shared Print Program and its current state of implementation. And then we'll pause for a few questions. And after that, I'll talk about the next phase that we anticipate and how we see Hathi Trust and other shared print programs evolving into a more global shared print ecosystem and what's necessary to get there. So you need, yeah, there, you figured it out. Great. There I am. First, I'll give you just a very brief background about um, how HathiTrust got started with the shared print program. Some of you remember a number of years ago in 2011, HathiTrust held a constitutional convention for all members at which a number of very important things were, were decided about the future of the organization. And one of them was a ballot initiative to consider whether HathiTrust should uh, venture into the shared print area. And it was called a, a Distributed Print Monographs Archive Initiative. And the membership at the Constitutional Convention approved that initiative, and which set the stage for, for future work. Then several years went by, most of which were spent on handling the very major governance and leadership changes in the organization that the Constitutional Convention had approved. Then in 2014, they came back to considering launching the Shared Print Initiative and established a, a planning task force with a number of, of people from uh, existing shared print programs uh, among Hathi Trust members. And that group spent a little over a year developing a very thorough and detailed report that was issued in 2015 and approved by the board. Then in 2016, I was hired as the shared print program officer to begin the actual implementation. The goals of the program that were laid out uh, both in the uh, ballot initiative and in and especially in the task force report, were specifically to link the preservation of the Hathi Trust digital items and, and corresponding items in the library collections. Also to help the libraries reduce the overall costs of managing print collections and to serve as a catalyst to promote the development of national and continental or even global collective management of collections. The, um, in Lorcan, Lorcan Dempsey's famous words, managing the collective collection. There were some specific key points that the planning task force recommended as part of the, their planning work. That the goal should be to get retention commitments for print holdings that correspond or mirror to book titles in the Hathi Trust digital collection. This is an important characteristic that distinguishes the Hathi Trust shared print program from, from all others, really. The Hathi Trust program is not attempting to look at the totality of member print collections and decide with them what, what volumes should be uh, retained. We are interested only in those that match to the digital collection, the Hathi Trust Digital Library. Another key attribute is that the Hathi Trust shared print collection should be lendable and distributed among the Hathi Trust member libraries. It's not a it's not a centralized thing, <coughs> or or even a um, several. Uh, small number of, of storage facilities supporting it. It's intended to be widely distributed. Another goal is that it was to be 
supported by and bring benefit to all members. We didn't want it to be an opt-in program, except in certain key areas. It's intended to be a, a, an integral part of HathiTrust membership. And also knowing that there are lots of other shared print programs that many of the HathiTrust members already are involved with, we wanted to build on those and not supersede them and, and not disturb them. The planning task force proposed two major phases. In the first phase, which they dubbed quick launch, the idea was to build momentum for this program by taking, um, taking a, a quick, appro quick launch approach towards, towards identifying the initial retentions and finalizing the policies and the MOU. That, that phase has taken place across 2016 and 17, and I will be, be talking about that in quite a bit more detail. Then in phase two, we're going to take a step back and, and build a more substantial infrastructure to support the, the shared print program that we have put in place and start looking at the next set of priorities to, to integrate and link the digitization and shared print to the extent that we can. So for the last little over a year, we've been working on phase one, the quick launch phase, and I'm pleased to say we are essentially done with phase one. During phase one, we had two major activities happening in parallel. One was finalizing the policies and the funding principles and the MOU, the, the terms of the agreement, in other words. And the second one was a process to identify the proposed retention commitments and the retention libraries that would, would participate. We had an enormous um, leg up because of the the detailed planning that had been done by the task force in terms of defining policies and funding principles. So we were not at all starting from scratch. Really the only way we could have done this in a little over a year time period was because so much of the planning work had already been done. So we, you know, we, we looked at the recommendations that had been made rather than starting all over from the beginning. In June of this year, the Haji Trust Board of Governors approved the, the MOU and the agreement and the, and the policies. And from that point, uh, from July through September of this year, we've been asking the libraries to execute the MOU. <clears throat> and at this point, 70% of them have, have done so. Some of them have already let me know that it'll be sometime in October before they complete the MOU execution. And I want to emphasize that because we were doing this in parallel, we were identifying the libraries and the volumes to be retained at the same time we were finalizing the policies, we emphasized to the participating libraries that they were not being asked to make a final commitment until after they had a chance to review and agree to the MOU. So we, we gave them a sort of a, a, a bailout possibility in case by the by the end point, if, if there were things about it that they just couldn't agree to, they, um, they could choose not to, not to go forward. So this is a list of the, of the uh, shared print retention libraries for HathiTrust. As you can see, the, the ones in blue are those that are also members of the Research Library Partnership. We have 49 libraries that have um, stepped up to be retention libraries. 45 of them are in the United States, as you would expect, three in Canada and one in Australia, the University of Queensland, which is also an RLP member. And the, this number 49 represents um, all of the libraries who propose to be, to be retention libraries 70% um, of them have actually signed the, the MOU and the, and the rest are expected to, but, but have not necessarily done it as of today. 
I want to describe a little bit about the shared print agreement, the, the, the MOU itself and the policies, and then I'll talk about the retention commitments that, that we have in place at this point. The agreement has two parts. The first part is an MOU document, which is a separate document to be signed by the retention libraries. It was designed to have very general and fundamental terms in it and to be uh, pretty brief. I think it's literally one page. Um, because the goal was to have to only sign this once and to have everything stated in it be as, as uh, permanent as we could imagine so that, we, so that as things evolve over time, we didn't have to ask the libraries to go back through a signing process again. The operating policies and guidelines are the more detailed specifications, I guess, or requirements of how we expect the libraries to, to um, act on and service these shared print materials with, among each other. The, 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 the more detailed policies and guidelines are separate from the signed agreement. They are, the, the agreement says the policies will be posted you know, publicly and they're, they're on our HathiTrust shared print website. Some of them have guidelines which is just a terminology or a section that we came up with for those that have kind of really specific specifications. So for example, there's a policy about envir environmental conditions and the locations where the books are kept and the guidelines say certain specific things that are, that are desired in terms of temperature and humidity and so forth. So the MOU document itself, the one that gets signed, has, has really four significant sections. That, that the retention library agrees to retain the, the designated volumes through this fixed date of December 31st, 2042, which is 25 years from 2017. It was felt that specifying the retention period was very critical and key to the whole agreement and should be part <coughs> of the MOU that gets signed. It also specifies that Hathi Trust will maintain a shared print registry recording these um, items that are being retained and will support the program through the established Hathi Trust budget process. And that's, that's the part that, mean, that means to convey that, that the Hathi Trust budget that applies to all members will, will apply to the portions of the shared print program that Hathi Trust pays for. In other words, that all members will, will be responsible for part of it. The MOU also includes some, some provisions to allow for the hopefully rare but certainly possible occurrence that a library might need to withdraw from the agreement. So it specifies that the library can take one of three actions uh, if they need to withdraw. They, <clears throat> they either have to transfer the volumes to another retention library or responsibility for the volumes, meaning in cases where other libraries hold copies of the same thing. Um, to, to get that library to agree to keep it. Or, and this is, this is the sort of um, wild card, <laughs> um, seek confirmation from Hathi Trust that the transfer is not required. Because we, we could envision there could be cases where certain categories of materials or, um, you know, it's 18 years from now, um, it may be possible for the, the Hathi Trust Board of Governors to say, yes, you're right, you're okay, you can just, you don't have to do that. We also included in the MOU a, um, a specification that no later than two years before the end of the 25-year period, 
the um, by December of 2040, we will formally look at the program and decide whether to let it expire in 2042 or extend it. And the MOU itself specifically says that <clears throat> if the decision is made to extend it, each individual retention library can decide whether or not they want to go forward. They, it doesn't automatically impose a, another term on them. They get, to, they get to decide if they want to participate in the extension. The, the policies, which as I said are the somewhat more detailed um, descriptions of how it will work, are largely in these categories. The scope I've already mentioned is monographs um, that are lendable, circulating monographs that correspond to items in the HathiTrust Digital Library. The retention period is also in the MOU, as I mentioned, but I do want to mention here that 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 our idea was that it's a it's a fixed date. Um, when we do our next cohort, that cohort of materials will also have a retention date of 1231-42. We we just wanted to avoid the whole rolling rolling time period issue. Um, for in terms of Shelving environment, uh, we don't require a storage facility. It's preferred, but retaining items in campus shelving is acceptable, and the, and the policy explicitly states that. Validation, which means verifying that these holdings actually exist, given that the metadata says they exist, but um, validating that the that the physical item corresponding to that made it metadata exists, and questions about condition. Um, that kind of validation is encouraged but not required. We had many, many discussions about this during all stages of the planning and um, ended up deciding, as most shared print programs do, that as desirable as validation might be, it's, it's just not feasible to validate every single item when you're talking about the quantities that we're talking about for monographs. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about the sampling project that was done in, in the EAST program, which <coughs> holds some value for, for uh, shared print monograph programs. Disclosure is a policy that means where, where you put the metadata saying that this item is being retained under a shared print agreement. Our policy currently says that the, the retention libraries agree to record these retention commitments in the Hathi Trust Registry database and also in the library's local system. We are planning for um, to use the future OCLC Shared Print Registration Service and probably would require disclosure in WorldCat at that point, but the policy does not currently say that. And finally, access. The policy uh, requires that the library be willing to lend the actual physical volumes to other HathiTrust members, but it doesn't specify a methodology for lending, and it, it specifically says that the library may use their existing local ILL systems and procedures and policies, including charging fees if they normally would charge lending fees. They are, they are not required to lend for free. The, the funding principles that we put in place, sometimes called business model, but funding principles is a better description of it. Some of the costs of the program are covered by Hathi Trust as an organization, meaning they are shared across all the Hathi Trust members through the, the Hathi Trust member fee. And Hathi Trust pays for program management, meaning staff like me, um, and uh, systems costs necessary to support the program. Thus far, that has meant uh, providing, paying for and provide 
uh, developer time to develop the, the shared print registry, for example. But, but the expectation is that uh, if we need future systems to support other functions, that that would be a central cost shared among, among all HathiTrust members. The retention libraries absorb their own costs. They're expected to pay for the, the effort to, to disclose the metadata in their local system and the effort to lend. They are also expected to absorb the costs of housing these materials long term. There is no um, compensation to the retention libraries for serving as retention libraries. I think I missed one. This was this was where my first question break was going to occur. So I'll stop for a little bit and see if people have questions. Okay, uh, good timing. We just uh, received we've received a couple of questions. So as a reminder to people, be sure to uh, that your chat is aimed at all participants. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question is. What is the reasoning behind requiring the lending of physical items which have digital surrogates? If part of this program is to ensure that the digitized object exists for re-imaging and quality assurance, et cetera, doesn't this put the object at risk, the physical object at risk? As you might imagine, there was a lot of discussion about that, um, about those issues. The the reasoning behind requiring the lending of physical items is mostly because of concerns about quality of some of the digital surrogates. You cannot assume that the digital copy um, in HathiTrust is, is always of sufficient quality to meet the need of a researcher who might need to see the print, the print volume. There is concern that it puts the object at risk, and um, often when often in shared print programs, there is a conscious effort to uh, retain multiple copies of the same work to to get around that that risk somewhat. But you're, you're right to raise the question. It was a uh, it was an important set of discussions, and um, after significant discussion, we we ended up deciding to uh, to require lending the physical volume. There is one aspect of it that that probably we will revisit in the next phase. Um, several of the libraries said. If I've got the only copy of this work in all of Hathi Trust, and you make me lend it, I probably just won't even offer to retain it. So we're going to look at a variation of the policy in the next few months, most likely, <clears throat> to say something like, uh, you know, if it's the only copy, to, to have a different um, a different tier of lending requirement to to account, especially for the cases where it may be the only copy in all of HathiTrust, and and thus not require it to be physically lent. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question: Why monographs only? Do you have any plans to include serials in the future? And I would also add to that: Are there other material types that um, you ever uh, think about adding, such as? Um, I don't know, films or videos or other things that are that are under copyright. Scary topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, monographs were chosen because they are um, they represent the vast majority <clears throat> of materials in the Hathi Trust Digital Library and also the vast majority of, of print holdings in um, in academic libraries. The so so kind of solving that problem solves a bigger set of problems. Um, it's 
I think it's likely that we would include serials in the future, but the main initial focus is on monographs. We, we also are looking to integrate the shared print monographs work with the HathiTrust federal documents uh, program. <clears throat> the, excuse me, I'm just got a scratchy throat today, I apologize. The, we, we do have a number of federal documents that ended up getting retained under phase one because they, had, they were cataloged as monographs. They were monographic federal documents. So we didn't make any attempt to exclude them because they were federal documents, but we also didn't target federal documents specifically. But that's an area where we might, uh, in the next phases, look, look in a more focused way at trying to bring those in. I doubt that we will do anything in particular with audiovisual materials, in, in part because the, the shared print program is, is, is dependent on the Hathi Trust Digital Library um, in the first place. So we, we are going to tend to follow the priorities set for the overall digital collection, which currently is focused on book-like materials. Thanks for that. There's a couple more questions, but I think I'm going to go ahead and um, let you let you continue with the presentation, and we'll catch up with the questions at the end. Um, okay. It's great to have so much uh, inter interaction and engagement from our audience, so please uh, be sure to keep the questions coming, and if we run out of time, we'll get Lizanne to uh, follow up in other yeah. ways. Okay. Uh, okay. Keep proceed. Okay. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the shared print commitments that we that we actually accomplished in phase one. This uh, nested Venn diagram is to show you the scope of what we were looking at. The the outermost circle the dark brown says that across all Hathi Trust member collections, there were 256 million print monographs. Looking just at the subset of Hathi Trust members that had volunteered to be retention libraries, which started out originally about 55 libraries, of those libraries, they hold in the aggregate, 145 million print monographs. Then within that set, 58 million of those match to the Hathitrust Trust digital monographs. So that middle circle, the sort of pink one, represents the universe that we were looking at, which were candidates to be become part of the shared print program. Then within that, the Hathitrust Trust Retention libraries volunteered to retain 16 million print monographs, which corresponded to 4.8 million distinct OCLC members. Several things I want to emphasize about how we figured out these phase one retentions. We intentionally wanted it to be a lightweight analysis and use commitments volunteered by the libraries. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a slide or two. There were three things that were required that, that they commit, that they propose volumes which were cataloged as monographs, that matched Tati Trust, and that they were willing to lend. We encouraged the libraries to think about identifying holdings that were already in a storage facility and that were unique or rare among the Hathi Trust libraries, and those that were already committed to another shared print program. We had a few cases where libraries had already taken part in a, in a venture like this and had already gone through a process of identifying holdings to retain. And we said, if you've done that already, we'll just grandfather in the ones that match to Hathi Trust so you don't have to do that process all over. In this phase, we made no attempt at all to 
predefine a desired number of copies to keep when there were multiple overlapping copies, nor to prevent duplication. We, we, it was going to be entirely library volunteered and library driven. We also did not set any kind of minimum commitment for the participating libraries. The, the resulting sets that we got, we, at, the, at the largest end, we have one library that volunteered more than two million volumes and several that volunteered around a million each. And at the smallest end, we had a library that volunteered less than 1,000. And, and all of those were perfectly fine under our definition of the phase one program. It, we, were, we were blessed by having access to print holdings data for all of the Hathi Trust members. So we could use that as the basis of this lightweight process that we had in mind. Um, those of you that are Hathi Trust members know that every year Hathi Trust asks you to submit a full set of print holdings to, to us, to HathiTrust, which is matched against the HathiTrust Digital Library because the HathiTrust member fee is based um, on, on the overlap between your collection and the HathiTrust Digital Library. So we had all that data already. So we, we looked at the 2016 data that the libraries had provided for the, the 50 or so that had volunteered to be retention libraries. And we sent back to them a file of their holdings, of their monograph holdings that matched Toddy Trust. Uh, we also included in the file we, we gave to them uh, some overlap counts for, for each record, each OCLC number, essentially, how many other retention libraries held it and how many Hathi Trust member libraries overall held it. So they could use that to figure out <clears throat> which things they had that were unique or rare or highly, highly overlapped. So then the libraries reviewed the, that material um, you know, at, at, in the, using their own criteria and sent back to us a file of the materials they were willing to commit to. A handful of them sent, said, nope, every, we'll, we'll do all of them. We're not even going to break it out. Um, but most of them uh, did some process to pick out the ones that they were willing to, to agree to. And as I mentioned, some of the libraries uh, just skipped that whole first process and just provided us a file of their existing commitments that they'd already made, such as to East. And then we, we matched it against the Hathi Trust file. To, and, and took those that matched. I want to give you a little um, overview of how these uh, shared print proposals correspond to different consortia or, or groups. And as my little note down at the bottom says, these are these are overlapping memberships. Um, you know, I didn't try to deduplicate in cases where a library might belong to more than one of these groups, but the the 33 OCLC research library partners that are among, the, among our retention libraries <coughs> account for 12.3 million volumes that were committed. The Big Ten Academic Alliance, 6.3 million, and, and so on and so on. Um, down at the bottom, the, the East Libraries, the Eastern Academic Scholars Trust, which is another monograph shared print program, um, six of those libraries are Hathi Trust Retention Libraries, and we took 300,000 of their existing commitments um, into the Hathi Trust Shared Print Program. I did a little bit of analysis of the commitments we've got. Um, we asked the libraries when they sent back their commitments to indicate whether the volume was held in campus shelving or in a storage facility. And we could tell from that and from other data that we that a little over half of them are stored in a storage facility versus a, ca a campus library. The, the second 
pie chart shows the holdings that also are committed to a different shared print program. So about 25% of them are also committed to, to a different program, not just Hathi Trust. But three quarters of them are committed so far only to Hathi Trust. You'll remember that I said we didn't make any effort to predefine a desired number of copies, nor to prevent duplication of retention commitments. And this, this chart shows how the ad hoc volunteer commitments actually played out in terms of redundancy. So of the 4.8 million titles or OCLC numbers that were committed, about a third of them were only committed by one of the retention libraries and had no other copies being committed. Half of them were committed by a small number between two and five libraries, and then the remaining 25% is um, you know, committed accidentally by, by larger numbers. The, a tiny percent, only 1% of the volume of the, of the titles were committed by <coughs> as many as 11 to 18 libraries. And of the 18 was the highest amount of overlap that we encountered out of the 50 libraries or 49 libraries. I also looked at how these commitments compared to overlap across all HathiTrust member collections. So how many of the commitments were for rare items versus very common items. So as you can see from this, um, a small, smallish percent, 10%, were unique across all of HathiTrust. And at the other end of the spectrum, another 10%, were held by more than 50, 10% of, of the committed items were held by more than 50, which is about almost half of the Hathi Trust member libraries. And here's my question thing. I just, I had, I had confused myself. But I think I'll go on into the next phase and come back to the questions at the end. So where we're at now, as, as we finish up getting the MOUs signed by the libraries, um, we're, we're starting the, the work on phase two. Uh, one obvious activity for phase two is to uh, begin working on a second cohort, get secure retention commitments for the, the remaining volumes. We also want to make use of the shared print registry data that we have, and we're going to be, be doing some um, relatively small-scale development to allow for searching the shared print registry and allow HathiTrust members to compare their holdings to the shared print registry. Um, we're going to consider modifying the HathiTrust catalog so that doing a regular HathiTrust catalog search, you could see the, the corresponding shared print commitments, if any. And we're going to investigate the ability to, for the retention libraries to report volumes lost or damaged and, and seek replacements for them. We're going to look at what our options might be for, for resource sharing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our current policy says treat the HathiTrust shared print items just like ILL, however you do ILL. We're going to look into seeing whether there's a more um, coordinated way to do it. And we're going to start looking at uh, how, to, how to coordinate with other efforts, and especially how what, one thing we've had in mind from the beginning is to coordinate um, New digital content in Hathi Trust with shared print commitments, so that so that um, we keep up with shared print commitments corresponding to new content that gets added to the digital catalog. 
we think that the um, that there may be some important impacts to the Hathi Trust program in particular. Um, one of them is that the fact that Hathi Trust is focusing on stewardship of those particular items that match Hathi Trust may affect other shared print programs retention decisions. It, it, it's already the case we're finding that, that libraries looking to establish a shared print commitment often look at whether the holdings are, are reflected in Hathi Trust or not, but frequently they don't end up necessarily um, choosing what to retain based upon that factor. And knowing that Hathi Trust is making a concerted effort to, to preserve those may affect how those decisions play out. Some of these other uh, things may help help all of us get to more of a global shared print ecosystem, which I think would have certain characteristics. That holdings would be discoverable um, and a way to coordinate preservation priorities and numbers of copies and so forth a way to do feasible validation, um, some way to do <clears throat> integrated resource sharing, and maybe other specialized services like, like scan on demand or print on demand. This one, the ability to have global discoverable holdings um, could best build off WorldCat in my humble personal opinion. I know I'm not the only one who thinks that, but. WorldCat is best positioned to be the, the, the global discovery tool for shared print holdings, as many people think of it as the global discovery tool for bibliographic holdings generally. OCLC is developing a shared print registration service which would let libraries upload some very minimal descriptive data. It's basically OCLC number and just a small handful of other things. And then OCLC would generate um, local holding records in WorldCat that would uh, describe the retention commitment. And this, this service is also planned to export back to the library a file to use to update their local ILS with variations for uh, different ILS providers. OCLC has been working on this for quite some time and the, the latest word I heard is that it's still expected to be released in fall of 2017 and uh, it would be part of an OCLC cataloging subscription. It's not, not an additional cost uh, service uh, for which we're very grateful to OCLC for, for uh, changing direction on that. We need a way to help these groups decide what priorities to retain and preserve, you know, what areas to move into next, how many copies is the right number of copies across what geographic areas, and what kind of organization is, is needed or put in place to make those recommendations or, or mediate them. I mentioned earlier that um, how do you trust decided not to not to require physical validation of the items <clears throat> it's it's rare among shared print programs because it's just so costly to look at every item and usually the programs compensate for that lack of validation by saying we'll just keep more copies the the east program did a sampling study last year in which 40 of their libraries randomly pulled and looked at 6,000 monograph volumes, and they looked at availability, meaning, you know, it, was it actually present or at least accounted for? It might have been legitimately charged out, and they had information about that. And they also looked at, in a very broad brush way at the condition, and they, and they found uh, these numbers in their sampling study that they could account for 97% of the, the volumes across 40 libraries, and 90% of them were in uh, usable condition, either, either average or, or excellent. 
And um, so it may be worth replicating that study or borrowing the results of that study as just kind of a template for, for other, other programs to use. We, um, in the future, it would be ideal to end up with a kind of an integrated resource sharing model um, in which resource sharing systems could, could know, could be aware of shared print copies <clears throat> and either prioritize lending from them or deprecate those if, they're, if certain ones are intended to be more as archives. Um, there could be lending providers that would scan on demand or print on demand or digitize as part of their service. The things that are in the way right now are the lack of infrastructure to support this. We don't currently have a common registry of everything that's in shared print under a shared print agreement. We are hoping to get to that point if people can start using WorldCat for that. Um, and there's no common resource sharing system or organization to organization or federation or allegiance to, to mediate priorities. The misaligned cost benefit one is um, an interesting one. Um, the the retention libraries, the, the libraries that that volunteer or are drafted to hold the volumes are incurring costs that benefit the other libraries. There is reciprocity, of course, because they get benefit from other libraries holding materials that they want. But the direct cost benefit is slightly misaligned. And there are, are concerns that free rider libraries might benefit from these holdings being retained for the long term, but not pay towards their support, and that faculty may object, especially if, um, if deselections happen in favor of materials being held by other libraries. So finally, at the end, um, I wanted to say, how can you all help? How can OCLC research library partners specifically help in this process? And, and one way is to, to begin to think of and promulgate to your constituencies that these kinds of shared print agreements are standard parts of collection management. They're not um, weird agreements that only certain kinds of libraries can do. They're becoming increasingly mainstream for for all kinds of, of academic libraries. But even more important and more specifically aligned to your role as OCLC research library partners is I would urge you to use your leverage to encourage L OCLC to do the things that it can most clearly do to, to benefit this kind of approach worldwide. There are pieces of the infrastructure that's needed that OCLC is best positioned to provide. And um, any help that you all can bring to bear to, to make that clear to, to OCLC products and services side would be greatly appreciated. I'm not going to go over these. This is for um, some background information that you can look at in the um, copied view of the, of the slide deck if you want to do some other reading. And now I'm back to the questions. Thank you, Lizanne. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is uh, sort of a, a clarification about, um, mm -hmm. about uh, items and what happens with items. So um, if and this perhaps goes to um, your, the validation. Um, is there an expectation that libraries will report lost items or undertake replacing them? So if libraries yeah. become aware, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there is. Um, one of the policies states that um, the libraries will make all reasonable, will take all reasonable 
steps to replace items that are uh, lost or, or significantly damaged. We are hoping to facilitate that by uh, providing a, a system function to let libraries report that a certain volume is lost or missing and uh, seek replacements from the other libraries. And, and again, because we have holdings data for, for all the libraries, we can, that, that system, it's in when we uh, are able to develop it, can, can look and say, you know, candidates for taking on this, for either providing a replacement or taking on the retention responsibility for it are these four libraries, because we know that they have it. But yeah, the, the policy says something, um, something like, all reasonable steps to replace. So it's sort of like a load balancing exercise. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, next question is, how will libraries record their record retention commitments in their local system? This was listed as a requirement under disclosure on a previous slide. What does this look like for most systems? The way we've described it in our policy currently is we say we want you to record these specific fields or the, these specific sets of data, but we don't specify exactly where in your system you put them. Um, for instance, we're, we say we want you to say that this is committed till 123142 um, under the Hathi Trust program. Basically, using the data fields that are defined in the OCLC recommended guidelines for um, for recording shared print commitments, but without we're not as specific as saying it has to be a 583 subfield Z. We're talking about maybe getting that specific with it, but the current policy just says we need you to record these fields, but it's your choice where you put them as long as you do it consistently, because some libraries, it depends on what system they have, whether it, wh whether and how it displays in their catalog, and we just didn't want to um, specify it in that much detail. Okay, great. Um, here's some uh, question that kind of goes to your motivations um, slide or your, your, your problems uh, slide. What encourages then libraries to retain, especially when they have to bear the management costs on their own? Um, and then there's a follow-up to that. Is there a contingency plan at the main retention library? So for example, one who retains more than a million items decides to withdraw. Yeah, the only contingency that we have is the the requirement that they um, find other that 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 they find other retainers for that material, or get Hathi Trust to absolve them from their responsibility to retain, which is probably less likely in a case like that. The only I think the original, the first part of the question was about um, what would motivate the libraries to participate. Yeah, yeah. Costs. What do you, what do you, yeah, exactly. What do you feel like since the, um, since they are uh, incurring costs? Yeah. Uh, what, what encourages it's, them to do this? What encourages them to do it is a perception of reciprocity, that that they would be getting a similar benefit from other libraries retaining other things. And that it's um, it's just it's it, I can't really articulate it in terms of a of a dollars and cents benefit. It's more of a of a uh, reciprocal community benefit. Here's a, a lovely uh, comment from one of our participants. As a participating library, I am doing it because it is the right thing to do at the right time, which is I think what. Uh, yes, spirit that motivates a lot of people in, in resource sharing. So you could put that on a t-shirt. Right thing yep. to do with the right thing. Perfect. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, so a final question, unless I see any others, and we are at about three minutes left, so we're getting close to time. You have a healthy number of participating libraries, which is really great. 
but do you have a sense of what the main barriers are for libraries who have not chosen to participate at the moment? Some of them probably are asking themselves that same question of, you know, why why should I incur costs that other people benefit from? But I wouldn't say that was most of them. I, I think most of the ones that didn't choose to participate are just um, sort of waiting to see how it works out. I've had several of them who said, you know, I just didn't really want to step up to phase one, but I'm interested in phase two. Um, so there's sort of a combination of, of philosophical concerns, like the first one, and more kind of organizational culture concerns. Right, and I should point out this question was asked before you showed your obstacle slide with the guy trying to yeah. roll the egg yeah. up the hill. <laughs> right. Yeah. Specific. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. I want to thank you, Lizanne, so much for your wonderful presentation today and also thank all of our participants for your engagement. Um, and uh, we have recorded this webinar and we will make that available along with the slides and email all of you who've registered for it uh, with, with that information and with those links. So thank you so much, Lizanne. Um, I hope you come back and talk thank to you. us another time. Thank okay, you. take care. I'd be happy to. Okay. Bye. Bye.